Good morning. We're turning our Bibles to Psalm 85 today. And the psalm is probably one of the great, great models on how to address the subject of revival. If you find yourself praying for revival, whether it be for this nation as a whole, for yourself as an individual, for family members, this is a passage of scripture musically developed that offers four stanzas as to how to, how to guide the thought processes to pray in a way that will move in such that the Holy Spirit is powerfully at work within lives that we're burdened for. You're going to notice as you're turning there that this is addressed to the choir master. It's a psalm of the sons of Korah. And the sons of Korah, uh, you can find their, uh, their, their pivotal moment back in Numbers chapter 16 in the Old Testament, where it seems as though uh, their ancestors, Korah and family, rebelled against the leadership of Israel, Moses and Aaron in particular. And God then, he demonstrated his justice towards those individuals. But at the same time, whenever you see God's justice at work, simultaneously you will see God's grace at work. And it's out of that line of Korah that you and I will then find that we have these musicians that have composed this extraordinary song, a psalm that offers us insight into the way in which God in his grace brings revival to his people. Psalm 85 is part of book three, and book three deals with the devastation at the hands of the enemies of Israel, and lo and behold, now what we see is the psalmist saying, despite all the bad things that are happening to us, look for the flickers of life found within us, which is what we need to be doing this morning. Explore first verses one through seven that I read. That will give us a sense of traction as to how we move forward in these verses. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation. Put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation which is our prayer this morning as we look together now to the Lord in prayer. And Father, as we do so, we are so thankful for who you are. We are in the presence of the triune God. God the Father, creating this world, creating something out of nothing. God the Son, dying in our place for our sins, securing redemption. The Holy Spirit working within, creating new life out of the deadness of the soul. You are the three in one, the triune God. We sense in these verses the holiness of God, contrasted to the sinfulness of humanity. But these are not irreconcilable differences. For you send Jesus Christ into this world to reconcile, to bring the reconciliation necessary for a new oneness to be experienced in you. So, Father, as we're exploring now these verses, the vitality and the richness that comes with understanding the significance of what the Bible would teach on the subject of revival. 
We're asking the moments to come that you would warm these hearts, that you would engage these minds, that you would shape these wills. As again, our Father, we come here to see Jesus, him only. Praying these things again now in Jesus' name. Amen. In one of the great revivals in history, the year was 1904, and news reporters went from London to get a first-hand glimpse as to what was happening in uh, the nation of Wales, the turn of the century, last century. And as they were arriving in Wales, one of them asked a police officer where the Welsh revival was taking place. And the police officer, drawing himself to an upright position, laid his hand on his heart, and then looking at the news reporters, said, Men, the Welsh revival is inside this uniform. The subject of revival is such that when you and I explore the richness of it, what's important for us to do is to distinguish between revival and revivalism. You don't go setting up a sign on a billboard saying revival will be happening uh, the week of. That's revivalism. That is man-made, human-manufactured. Revival is not manufactured by humanity. Revival is a work of God for humanity within humanity. As I was looking at the various volumes I have on my shelves on the subject of revival, one of the foremost writers on the subject, J. Edwin Orr, puts it like this, that when it comes to matters of revival, these are times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, where to be in the presence of the Lord is to be revived. And when a community of believers is brought low before the presence of the Lord, the very air that they breathe appears to be supercharged with a sense of God's presence. That's the beginning of revival. It is revival. Christian History Journal, one of its publications, these are words as follows, that awakenings, which are various spiritual revival periods in history, are usually preceded by a time of spiritual depression, spiritual apathy, where in which a majority of nominal Christians are hardly different from the members of secular society. It is as if they can't be distinguished. And the church seems to be asleep. But then, there's an individual, or perhaps a small group of God's people, who become conscious of the hidden aspects, you see, of the condition. They become aware of matters pertaining to distance from God. And they begin to seek God. Asking for God's forgiveness for sin. And beginning to yearn for a new manifestation of God's power. A new awareness of God's presence. And all of a sudden God breaks in. And once again, believers are distinguished in secular culture. And things begin to change. What I want to do is to explore this subject revival found in Psalm 85 this morning. Four stanzas that we're going to pull together that will give us a better understanding as to how we can work in our matters of prayer, as we approach God personally, for family, that one who's distancing self from God, and for this nation, which was how these individuals, the sons of Korah, 
viewed this psalm. Four stanzas. Let's dig in. The first comes out of one through three, that as you and I pray for revival within our nation, within our families, for us as individuals, in this first stanza, note with me the works that God the Lord has done. And now it starts off with L-O-R-D, capitalized. And you say, why is that so significant, Gary? Well, here's the thing. The prior Psalms in Book 3 have the Sovereign One revealed as Elohim, capital G, small O-D, which was a generic name to describe God in relationship to the nations. But now in the prior Psalms of Book 3, it's as if the baton is being uh, passed from the sons of Asaph who spoke of Elohim to now the sons of Asaph in 84 and 85, and once again reinvigorate us with this this term, capital L-O-I-D. In other words, your sovereign one who sent Jesus to die for our sins wants us to understand the richness of a relationship with God through him And the covenantal relational name for the Sovereign One is L-O-R-D. And so now, longing for the people of Israel to be able to reinstitute this dynamic of oneness with their God. In this opening stanza, the prayer is, Lord. And now what follows are six verbs in the past tense that equip the believer who is praying, say, for family members who are distancing, the believer who is longing for that flickering light in the nation to once again shine brightly, six verbs that are in the past tense that speak of the way in which God once worked, and it's as if you're saying, do it again, God. Do it again. Lord, Lord, You were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. The word restored here carries with the idea to turn. It's as if now God is turning again to the people because they, in essence, are turning to him. And I hit the pause button at this point. It was the 1730s. Jonathan Edwards became pastor at Northampton in Massachusetts. He sensed that there was nothing but spiritual deadness around. There had been previous revivals under his predecessor, Solomon Stoddard, who had pastored for some 50-plus years in Northampton at that church. He was concerned for the next generation. So in 1734, he began to develop a series on Sunday mornings on justification by faith alone, speaking from the book of Romans. In his journal, he writes, By December... The Spirit of God began extraordinarily to set in. Revival grew, and souls did, as it were, come by floods to Christ. In over a six-month period, Edwards recorded over 300 conversions, which he wrote about in his volume, Narratives of Surprising Conversions describing the revival and its effects on the life of the town. So now, there's this longing for restoration. And so when you are praying, perhaps, for the nation, or you're praying for extended family members, and for some it seems as though what once was so vital, so dynamic, so filled and supercharged with life, 
now it seems like everything is minimalistic. You take the stories of the past and you say, do it again, God. Do it again. Like Edwards and what they experienced in Northampton. You were favorable. You restored. In verse 2, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all, not some of their sin. And now what's incorporated into the score, because these are musicians at this point, developing this musical piece, once again is what you and I might call a rest. Hebrew word selah wants you to pause, wants you to think about what it is that has been composed here at this point. Think about the past tense works of God. You were favorable. You restored. You forgave. You covered. And notice again and again and again, it's you, 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 not we, we, we. This is an initiative by God for God. Great Awakening. In the 1700s, George Whitfield, an Anglican evangelist, friend, colleague of John Charles Wesley, not only traveled through Great Britain, but also made seven trips to the States between 738 and 770. Probably the most well-traveled man in the colonies, drew large crowds wherever he spoke, and widespread revival was most clearly seen during his second journey from 1739 through 41. He toured the colonies and he would speak to large crowds in the open air and the crowds were too large for the churches. This is highly personal because our home in Middletown, Connecticut, looked out over the landscape of where Whitfield would in fact speak to such crowds. And the church, the first of the churches that we planted, the one in the Connecticut River Valley, Valley Bible Evangelical Free, is positioned right there in the midst of where these revivals took place, the fields out of which Whitfield was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, he was fascinated with Whitfield's speaking ability, couldn't figure it out as more of a secularist, the effect that his words had upon the people, and though he never openly became a Christian, became a friend of Whitfield's and his publisher in the U.S., impressed with the change Whitfield's gospel was producing in the colonies. And so Franklin, as a secularist, wrote, it was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants from being thoughtless or indifferent about, in his view, religion. It seemed as if all the world was growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in any evening without hearing psalms sung by different families of every street. Picture that. This is a secular take on what God was doing. Thomas Prince of Boston founded the first regularly published magazine in America on the Christian history to report the news of the revival in the colonies. You're done with your Selah. You pick it up in verse 3. Still more you. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. And now what you do is you pull together this you concept that continuously appears. And you're saying, this is all about you, by you, for you. Do it again, God. 
take those extraordinary experiences that this nation has, has been able to process. Take the amazing truths that were instilled in this family a decade, two decades ago where everything seems so vital, so dynamic, so alive. Revive. Do it again, God. Do it again. Don't you long for such dynamic in your life? Remember when you first came to know the Lord? I think it's so alive. So fresh. Do it again, God. Bring that life into the midst of the present. Mm. And as you're praying this first stanza through, maybe with your, your life groups, youth group leaders, worship team leaders, Review what God has done in 1 through 3, because there are six verbs here to describe such, but you're not done. You just completed your first stanza. Because you move into the second stanza, and you move from the works that God has done in 1 through 3 to the restoration that God can provide in 4 through 7. And now notice the wording. And notice how it's phrased. Restore us. Includes self at this point. Talking about believer. And he's tying now his past together with those around him. And he's saying, restore us, including self, again. He has recounted what has taken place in the past. So now there's the sense of, I need an again. Restore us again, O oh God of our salvation. This is what you're praying for your, your loved ones. This is what you're praying for, for your church. This is what you're praying for your nation. Put away your indignation toward us, exclamation point. But now what he's going to do for you and for me in the coming verses is to create a series of questions Eventually answering a question with a question. But he begins here with the questions, will you be angry with us forever? No. There will be a period. Will you prolong your anger to all generations? The sons of Korah would say no. We are living proof of that very fact that we are here, though our forefathers rebelled against God's will, we're here to talk about the grace of God that has so filled our extended family with new life. God breaks in. David Brainerd, in his journal, dated August 6th of 1745, tells this story. The Indians seemed eager of hearing, but they appeared nothing very remarkable except their attention. Till near the close of the teaching, when it seems so truths were attended with a surprising influence, and there were scarcely three and forty who could not refrain from tears. Their hearts just seemed to be pierced with the gospel. No surprising were now the doings of the Lord, the works of the Lord, that I can say no less of this day and need to say no more of it than the arm of the Lord was powerfully, marvelous revealed in it. It was John Wesley who would eventually write, let every pastor read carefully the life of David Brainerd. And certainly I took that advice. And one day in New England, I was walking through some fields with two other friends from uh, the leadership board of our church that we had just started looking for land to purchase and uh, looking for a sizable land because I thought God was going to do a great work. And 
began, I slightly tripped over a, a semi-large stone, pushed the grass away and realized it was a monument to David Brainerd. A statement that this is where he administered to the Indians. And I knew we we're close to where we need to be able to purchase land. And we did, close to 30 acres in the very region in which Whitfield, Brainerd, and others ministered. And it became a place of do it again, Lord. Do it again. Pray that for your family. Pray that for your life. Pray that for the nation. Because now you and I find that in verses 6 and 7, he answers his questions, well, with the question, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Do you see the extraordinary connection here between revive and rejoice? Have you reached a point in life where perhaps you've lost the sense of joy that you once had in the dynamic of your relationship with God? Could it be that revival is necessary within your own soul so that there is a renewed sense of rejoicing that comes from revival itself from within? American Revival of 1858. Just prior, in fact, to the Civil War, ships coming near the American ports, they seem to come into a zone of the Spirit, Holy Spirit's influence. Ship after ship arriving with the same story of sudden conviction and conversion. When one ship, a captain of the entire crew of 30 men, uh, put faith in Jesus Christ out at sea, and they entered the harbor, the writer tells us, rejoicing. And now in verse 6, he's saying, will you not revive us again? Don't you want to be able to experience joy once again like you once had? Will you not revive us again that your people, he speaks of to God, your people may rejoice in you? What comes of all this? In verse 7, here is the appeal. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord. The Hebrew word, I love the word in the Hebrew, hesed. It's so hard to be able to fully define in the English. But it's this loyal, covenantal, relational love that God has for his people. But now what I want you to see at the end of the second stanza is how it how it connects to the first word of the first stanza. Because you're dealing with, show us the, your steadfast love, O Lord. Which takes you back to how this begins in the first verse, Lord. And now at the end of verse 7, grant us your salvation. And that what he is referring to now at this point is not the initial work by which God delivers you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He's talking about people who have lost their first love. And it seems as though they have allowed, even in the kingdom of light, that the door of their heart has really introduced some darkness into their souls. And he's saying, God, turn on the light. Bring brightness, bring lightness to that person who once had it. But now it just seems as though the light, the life, it's flickering. Do it again, God. Do it again. 
Jonathan Edwards established in Northampton Church um, concerts of prayer. His version of life groups where they got beyond just asking how you doing and how can I pray for you to great movements of the Holy Spirit where they began to intercede together collectively, taking it to the level of, of praying for the colonies, asking God to break in. And what is utterly fascinating is that Edwards ministered just prior to the American Revolution. So now, there you have your first stanza is you pray for revival, perhaps for yourself, for your family, extended family, your friends, the people you're seeing, uh, that loved one that's close to you, the nation. You pray, first of all, the works that God has done. Recount them back to God. And second of all, the restoration that God can provide. Uh, you found it there in verses 4 through 7. But you're up to the third stanza, aren't you? And this musical composition that equips you, equips your life group, uh, empowers conscious of prayer to be able to impact for the glory of God. Thirdly, the truths that God has revealed. Because it seems now in this third stanza, what he is doing, that the writer is are imploring, is that we become seekers, we become hearers of God's word. You're at the edge of the seat, not only on a, a Sunday morning if you're watching right now on the line where you're at the edge of your seat, but through the course of the, of the days and the weeks, me even at work, what do you want to teach me? Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, the covenantal sovereign one. For he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. And what I want to do with you at this point is to bracket, if you will, his people, his saints. In verse 8, because what God is doing is he's taking ownership. He's saying to you, he's saying to me, you belong to me. Do you have the mark of ownership on your heart? Do you have the dynamic of life within your soul? If not, do it again, God. Take me back to my first love. For as now you read in verse 9, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land, and now he begins to look around politically. And he ponders what has happened uh, in matters of invasions. And he's longing for God's presence to be felt. That glory may dwell in our land. The Welsh revival in 1904, a miner hardened against God, returning from his shift about four in the morning, saw the light in the chapel, decided to check it out, walked through the open door, overwhelmed by what we are told by J. Edwin Orr as a sense of God's presence. And he was heard to exclaim, quote, Oh, God is here, unquote. And we're told that he was afraid either to enter or depart. And there on the threshold of the chapel, the work of salvation began to take place in his heart. Again, Jonathan Edwards would write in 1735 that the town seemed so full of the presence of God. And it was never so full of love, nor so, nor so full of joy, and yet so full of distress as it was then because God was working in hearts, moving people in his direction. And that's what you want for the nation where, again, believers become distinguished at work and in neighborhoods and communities because you've got the stamp of ownership, God's ownership upon your life, which leads us to the final stanza, the stanza, four stanzas of, of a concert of prayer to God for revival, noticing, fourthly, now, the blessings that God will supply 
and you pick it up in verse 10, and I want you to see what I will call points of convergence, where steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Or to put it another way, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Where is this sense of intimate connectedness, righteousness, and peace? The word peace, shalom. Where you live among people who are continuously wondering, where can I experience peace? when they need to be declared righteous by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. This is where the kiss is found and the kiss takes. Because you now look at it a different way in verse 11. And I want you to see convergence not only horizontally in, in verse 10, but vertically in verse 11. Faithfulness springs up from the ground And righteousness looks down from the sky. Another way of saying convergence. And when you are praying this way and revival is occurring this way, there is a sense of convergence in your life where prior to this, everybody and family and nation, so on, everybody seems so disconnected, alienated, detached. But now as you pray this concert of prayer to God, the result is there are reattachments being made, connections being reestablished as you're praying, Lord, do it again, God. Do it again. Horizontally in verse 10, the imagery is such that it's vertically in 11. And so you end in verse 12. Yes. You've been waiting for the yes. Yeah. The Lord will give what is good. It doesn't say we will achieve what is good. It's all of God. It's grace. The Lord will give what is good. Notice the economic impact upon the nation that understands the significance of revival among the people. Our land will yield its increase. Israel was an agricultural community at that point. But to stress again what's on his heart, righteousness will go before him making his footsteps, make his footsteps away. And I thought about that. You know, just prior to the Civil War, major revival was actually broke out. And then as the war began in the Union Army, between 100,000, 200,000 soldiers came to saving faith. Among the Confederates, approximately 150,000 Perhaps about 10% of all Civil War soldiers experience conversion in the midst of the conflict. And sometimes God allows for conflict to be the basis for convergence, where everything now comes back together. Do it again, God. Great revival occurred among Robert E. Lee's forces in the fall of 1863. Winter of 64, where some 7,000 soldiers came to saving faith. Revivals also swept through the Union Army. And sometimes a prayer gathering would be taking place 24 hours a day, where concerts of prayer were being established in small group gatherings, their versions of life groups, whereby each was taking a particular hour of the day, we're told that during that time, chapels couldn't hold the soldiers who wanted to get inside, no matter the day or the night. And it's fascinating to me that at the end of the Civil War, it's known as the time of Reconstruction. But historians need to be able to connect the idea of revival that led to Reconstruction and not separate these out because there has to be a convergence. 
And if you're longing for family life to be reconstructed, if you're longing for your life to be reconstructed, begin with a revival that leads to reconstruction and then watch out. You're praying. You're taking Psalm 85 seriously. And as you do so, what you're able to say is that God's at work. He's doing this in a way that brings glory exclusively to his name, for his name, and for his name only. And you give all praise to him. And that's why you close with the thoughts that God gave to Solomon in a night. I've heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Listen to the economic impact tied to the need for relational reconnectedness. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayer that is being made in this place. So said God to Solomon. And when you pray Psalm 85, collectively, corporately, Concert of prayer format. Watch out. Convergence takes place. A renewal occurs. Revival sets in. Do it again, God. Do it again. Let's stand together. And so, Father... We have followed the format of Psalm 85. We have recounted story after story just from a miracle alone of revival. Revolutionary War before and after. Civil War before and after. Events at the turn of the centuries. And so may we now take these truths that are found in these four stanzas Apply them in our life groups. Use them. Use them in our prayer for our family members. Use them in the way we long to see you at work, in the business community, in the hospitals, in the schools, in the neighborhoods. Do it again, God. And when you do it again, we give all praise to you. In Jesus' name.